thank you for the invitation. Um, there will be some overlap, as you can imagine, between my talk and previous talks, particularly Sergei's. Uh, we've been thinking about similar lines for several years now. Um, I was pleased to be invited to talk about this topic, and particularly to answer the question, why is it so difficult to calculate by the capacity? Um, I've been asked the opposite question many times before. What is the capacity of the optical fibers? And I always fail to answer it, just as everyone else does. Uh, but this time I was asked the dual question, and I'm kind of happy about that, because I actually think I can answer that, this question, at least give the partial answers. And uh, I'm going straight to the answers. The title was the question, and uh, the first slide shows my answers. There are four uh, main reasons why capacity in an information theoretic sense is so hard to calculate. First, there's, there are multiple definitions of capacity and some confusion between them, as I already hinted. Uh, second, the computational complexity in evaluating uh, capacity and related quantities uh, are typically huge. Third, there are the uh, intricate issues about modeling a continuous time physical channel in a discrete time manner, which, as we shall see, is essential in order to apply all the information theoretical tools we are aware of. And finally, I will say something about the available bounds on capacity, upper and lower bounds, uh, which sometimes can be uh, a bit loose. So these were my answers, and I will immediately con convert this to an outline of my work. I will go through these answers uh, sequentially. Um, the first item is about the uh, capacity definition. What is capacity? And uh, well, this is very similar to Sergei's first one of Sergei's first slides. There are two, two typical notions of capacity. There's a daily life usage of capacity as a quantity for uh, for the throughput of a given system, including transmitter, fiber, and receiver. And uh, it has a certain throughput, and in daily life we call that the capacity of the system. That's perfectly fine, and it's the most common usage of the word capacity. However, if you ask an information theorist, uh, there is also a maximization involved. The information theorists like to talk about channel capacity, which is a property of the channel. More specifically, it's the maximum throughput you can push through a channel, uh, given that you choose the combination of transmitter and the receiver hardware and software in an optical manner. And this is the second. Uh, um, and notion of capacity, which I will focus my talk on today. And again, as Sergei mentioned, there are different flavors of this capacity. Um, there's a per sample capacity, which is like time channels. It gives you the capacity in bits per symbol or bits per channel use. Um, it applies to discretized system, and if you multiply this quantity with a sampling rate, you will get uh, the capacity in bits per second of the underlying continuous time channel. And finally, you can normalize it respect, with respect to bandwidth, whatever that is, and uh, uh, get a characterization of the spectral efficiency. Uh, in some more detail, um, the channel we have here is it's the optical fiber. It's a continuous fine uh, process where the waveform X of T in and the waveform X Y of T out. Um, and the channel capacity is the maximum throughput in this per second that you can uh, get through this channel um, with, given, with optimal choices of transmitters and receivers. And with transmitter, I mean all the uh, devices available, including fake encoding, modulation format, ESP, pulse shaping, and the reverse processes on the receiver side, including, say, nonlinearity compensation, sampling, and everything. In the end, there are bits in, there are bits out, and uh, 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 <coughs> uh, the optimum bit rate is the capacity. 
Most often, the capacity is conditioned on some quantities. For instance, you can show the capacity as a function of the transmitting power. Uh, it's also common to constrain it, the modulation format. Maybe you're confined to a certain family of modulation formats. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, it's very common to normalize the capacity with respect to that. <coughs> and then you have to ask, ask yourself the question, uh, what is the bandwidth in non-linear system? I think this question has received too little attention so far. Um, this is what it looks like typically if you transmit the band-limited pulse on an optical fiber, in this case a 100 kilometer fiber. It's a nicely band-limited waveform, uh, sorry, pulse on the transmitted um, on the transmitter side. And then as it propagates, it broadens it. And what is the bandwidth of this? Well, the most common definition, implicitly or explicitly, is to use the transmitter bandwidth. But as you can see here, that's very risky, particularly if you want to apply this bandwidth definition in a WDM setting and believe that your uh, system bandwidth is the transmitter plus bandwidth, and you will get uh, a huge uh, interchannel interference in your market. So a more uh, practical, practical, useful definition would be to say that the system bandwidth is a maximum of the signal bandwidth at any point of the finder, uh, which is more practically useful but harder to treat analytically. Uh, nevertheless, there's no way around the question. Whenever we talk about spectral efficiency, we must define what we need with bandwidth. Uh, and of course, this definition in turn influences your definition of spectral efficiency. Moving on, um, there's a huge compl computational complexity involved if you want to characterize the channel capacity. <coughs> um, the favorite tool among information theorists to uh, quantify the channel capacity is the uh, the famous channel coding theorem. Uh, and the first thing I want to say about the channel coding theorem is that it does not apply to waveform channels. Our fiber is a waveform channel and you cannot apply the channel coding theorem directly to it. You need to do something with your transmitter and receiver. Namely, you need to split it into two units such that you get an intermediate quantity which is discrete. Now I've introduced somehow a, a vector of samples in the receiver and the transmitter, and if we call the, that the discrete time channel, including the inner parts of the transmitter and the receiver, then we have a discrete time channel from a vector in to a vector out, and the, the channel coding theorem, as most of you probably know, is uh, applicable to such channels. Uh, more specifically, the um, the channel capacity is the maximum of a quantity called the mutual information. Mutual information is a multidimensional integral with a very beautiful form here. Um, and if you calculate that and optimize that over all your input distributions, Px, you get the channel capacity. Uh, the duty of this is that it gives us a tool to evaluate the performance of the system with ideal tech without actually implementing the tech. <coughs> um, now this is the beautiful side of it. Uh, the back side again is the, uh, the computational complexity, which comes from several reasons. First, the mutual information is a multidimensional integral, and uh, doing numerical integration over many dimensions is fairly complex process. Uh, even worse, when you have calculated this integral, you need to optimize it over a large number of input distributions, which is even more complex. Um, there's the issue about the discrete time channel model, which, as I showed, includes part of the transmitter and the receiver, namely the mapping from, um, from symbols to waveforms. And the information theory gives no, no clue about how to design this map. It may, for instance, include 
um, some of the um, processes developed in these two projects, nonlinear compensation, uh, nonlinear Fourier transform, things like that. All these give us different discrete time channel models. The channel coding theorem gives us a tool to evaluate the performance of a discrete time channel, but it does not give us the tool to design the discrete time channel. And finally, everything assumes that we know a probabilistic dis uh, description of the output given, which is not always the case. I will talk more about that now. The discrete time channel model. I don't need to spend many seconds introducing the nonlinear Schrodinger equation to this audience. Uh, it relates the input waveform to the output waveform using a, a nonlinear partial differential equation. Um, it's considered to be very accurate, but it gives us no explicit relation between the input waveform and the output waveform. It does give us an implicit relation between the sample versions via the split step Fourier method. Uh, so you can, we can simulate it numerically for a given in, uh, vector of input samples and get the, the vector of the output samples. Um, but that is an implicit relation. It's not the distribution of y given x, which means we cannot directly calculate this capacity. As Sergey already uh, discussed, um, there are many discrete time models available. <coughs> I'd like to show them on, on this axis where, in order to show the dilemma between accurate channel modeling and the information theoretically useful channel models. So in one extreme, we have the nonlinear Schrodinger equations, which is super uh, accurate, on the, um, but very hard to handle information theoretically. In the other extreme, we have the linear Gaussian channel, which does not represent the fiber very well, but we know everything about its capacity. Um, and then we have several intermediate stages, here are just a few of them. Uh, Sergey showed us more. And their capacities are partially known, I would say, uh, where there is a tendency that the capacity is better understood towards the left of the diagram, where the models are uh, less accurate physically. Um, note in particular the sample nonlinear Schrodinger equation here whose accuracy obviously depends on the sampling rate. If we have a high sampling rate, we move to the right, we get an accurate representation of the analysis. <coughs> but as we go to see in a couple of slides, we get weaker bounds or weaker characterization of the And vice like versa. Um, so, um, the last part of my talk is about capacity bounds. Uh, in situations where we don't know the channel capacity, the standard tool among information theorists is to apply bounding techniques. If you can find an upper bound and a lower bound on a certain quantity, in this case the capacity, and if they are relatively close to each other, well, then you can say something about this quantity. We want to sandwich the capacity between upper and lower bounds. <coughs> and how to derive these bounds uh, is very different, depending on whether we want a lower or an upper bound. A lower bound is essentially the performance of any given system. It, it, it's it's a, an, an achievable rate. It shows what is possible. And you only need a single example to show something that's possible. An upper bound, on the other hand, says what is impossible to do, <coughs> then you must consider all possible uh, scenarios, all possible transmission schemes, which is, of course, much harder. Therefore, uh, there has been much more work on lower bounds than on upper bounds. Um, and again, there is a trade-off between the accuracy of the model and the quality of the bounds you, apply, you obtain uh, for uh, uh, models. I will spend my last three slides discussing some techniques that have been used for bounding the capacity. 
There are two standard methods to lower bandwidth capacity. One, as I already mentioned, is to um, uh, skip the maximization of input distribution. Choose your favorite input distribution and evaluate the neutral information. That is a lower bandwidth capacity. Uh, practically, it means you fix the modulation format, you fix your pulse shape, you fix your uh, receiver, and so on, and the, that gives you an input output relationship and you calculate its usual information. Uh, that is a lower bandwidth capacity and a lot of work has been done obtaining lower bound, including in these two projects. Uh, there have been some really big improvements in the lower bounds in uh, unlock and hyperhighway uh, by selecting smart modulation formats. The second somewhat more sophisticated way to obtain uh, lower bounds, which has also been studied in, in these projects, is the so-called mismatch receiver principle. Uh, the mismatch receiver principle builds on an inequality, and if you look at the right-hand side of this uh, inequality, you see an expression that is very similar to the mutual information. But if you look carefully, you can see that the expression inside the logarithm has replaced the channel statistics P with some other channel Q. Uh, Q is the so-called uh, auxiliary channel. And if you replace P with Q in this expression, it can be proven that you get a lower bound on the usual information. And of course, then you choose your Q such that it's easier to evaluate. Uh, it's quite popular to choose this at Gaussian, uh, as a Gaussian conditional distribution, for instance. It has been used successfully in optical communication. Uh, so these are the two standard techniques for lower bounding the capacity. A lot of improvement have been done in the past years, and uh, there's still more work to be done here. We know much less about upper, upper bounds on capacity. Um, the first approach uh, is the so-called non-linear channel limit. Uh, David already presented that, and I agree with everything David said about the non-linear channel limit. It's intuitively very reasonable, because uh, and it has been observed that the nonlinear interference can be modeled as Gaussian noise. And the variance of this noise grows very rapidly with power. So therefore, uh, the SNR decreases as high, at high power. And this has been taken as an argument that uh, uh, the capacity would also decrease uh, at high power. Um, but that's intuition. Uh, theoretically, there's no foundation, uh, there's no theoretical support for this intuition. Um, the assumption that uh, nonlinear interference is Gaussian is actually a mismatch receiver's assumption. If the receiver assumes that the noise is Gaussian and is designed accordingly, um, we get a lower bound on capacity. Not an upper bound, it's a lower bound because of the mismatch receiver principle. Um, and if the receiver would assume something smarter, uh, including the techniques presented by Sergei, we can push this upwards. And if it can be pushed upwards, of course it's not an upper bound. It can't, cannot be a fundamental limit if it can be pushed up. And this was uh, nicely shown in a recent paper by Marco Secondini. Um, and uh, the conclusion is that the nonlinear channel limit is not a channel limit. It's a very useful quantity. It's a lower bound on capacity, but the name is slightly misleading. Uh, also, it has been shown that the capacity does not decrease with power, as I may already mentioned. Um, so I think a lot of work remains here as well in pushing this bound, the nonlinear channel limit, which is actually the lower bound, in pushing it upwards. Uh, these projects have done a big improvements there, but there's more work to be done. I want to mention one last approach 
to the to upper bounding capacity, which is relatively recent. And uh, it was uh, presented by Kramer and Yusef a couple of years ago. Um, it takes a new approach uh, to the bound capacity bounding problem in that it uses the split step Fourier method, which has previously been thought about as a simulation tool. It actually uses it at the channel model. It relates an input vector to an output vector. There's not an explicit e equation, but every single step of it, uh, every split step in the Fourier uh, in the SSFM um, can be described analytically. And then you can characterize the overall scheme using the cascade of these uh, steps. And you get this very simple equation. Uh, and that is a true upper bound. If we plot it in the same diagram as a lower bound, we get a family of curves. I cannot plot a single curve because there's a, a free parameter here which I can design myself, the sampling rate. The bound applies to the discrete time channel formed by sampling the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And if I sample this denser, uh, I will get a more and more accurate representation of the channel, but I will also get a weaker bound. I will get less interesting results as the bound free bubbles. Um, and conversely, if I try to reduce the sampling rate, I can get curves in the other direction. Now I get more and more interesting bounds in the sense that the upper bounds go down. But on the other hand, I'm deviating from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And at some point, I will even get an upper bound that is below known lower bounds. And that's, of course, uh, uh, nonsensical. It only proves that the upper bound applies to different channels. Uh, the lower, lowest upper bound clearly applies to a different channel than the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And the optimal sweet spot here is, well, I don't think it exists. Uh, we want to go upwards in order to represent the physical channel, but we want to go downwards in order to get something that is reasonably tight. So here's a lot of work, a lot of room for future work. Nevertheless, I think it's a very important step because it's actually the first truly valid upper bound for a realistic fiber channel. I will conclude um, the capacity of a realistic fiber channel is still unknown. Many capacity results are available, but they are all for simplified channels.